Philippe, thanks for having a word with us, it's having a fantastic chat. fantastic to be here. I'm sort of amazed at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, the sort of graveyard slot, that there is anyone here at all. Well done. Muzzled off to you all. <laughs> Got up early. Um, <laughs> why don't we start with Lviv, Lvov, Lemberg, the town. Mm. Tell us a bit about it. So I knew nothing about it in 2010 um, when I received an invitation to give a lecture on the work that I do both as an academic at the University of London and as a barrister doing cases on crimes against humanity and genocide. Basically, out of the blue, I get an invitation saying, would you like to come to Lviv and give a public lecture on your work and your cases on crimes against humanity and genocide? And I wrote back to say I would. What I didn't tell them was that the reason I would was that my grandfather was born in the city when it was called Lemberg. In 1904, he was born. It was also known as Lvov. And basically, I was just curious to want to know uh, what it was like, what were the streets he had walked on. Um, I'd grown up in a family, as many families of people who've been through traumas, of silences. There were things that were not to be talked about that happened in the war period and beyond. And so it proved to be an opportunity to open that door. Before I went, uh, I asked my mum uh, whether my grandfather had any papers that would help me track down the house that he lived in. And she came out, as mums do, with two big, you know, sort of little briefcases, big briefcases, absolutely crammed with papers that I'd never seen before. And they, I remember sitting on the floor of her living room and just taking this stuff out, and it was unbelievable stuff. It was photographs and documents and Nazi passports and expulsion orders and just a mass of material. I'd lived for 50 years and I'd never seen this stuff. And with that material, I then began to open doors. Lviv itself is now situated in the Western Ukraine. It used to be part of the Soviet Union, part of Germany, part of Poland, part of Russia, part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It is a completely <laughs> amazing place. And the other thing about it is it has coffee of a quality that almost matches <laughs> that of Australia. Well done. Which I can't understand why it has such good coffee, but you should all, if you are interested, it's very safe. The food is fantastic and the coffee is fantastic. And it's got that real ideological ferment. I mean, there's Martin Buber is there. It's that classic liberal European city of the socialists and the fascists arguing over coffee with the uh, poet next to them sort of thing. It's a city that was a sort of multicultural metropolis. Poles, Austrians, Hungarians, Armenians, Jews, Ruthenians, merchants from Venice. It has one of the oldest universities in the world, older than Harvard University, a fantastic philosophy department that it had, a fantastic mathematics uh, department, a fantastic biology department, a law faculty that was one of the great law faculties of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. As I'm researching to go and deliver my public lecture in October 2010, I make two stunning discoveries, the first of many. The first is that, remarkably, I learn that the man who put the concept of crimes against humanity into international law, a man called Hirsch Lauterpacht, professor of international at Cambridge University, was from Lvov, Lemberg. He had studied at the very same university that I had been asked to go and lecture at. Now, they had no idea about this. They were unaware of this fact. And then... Stunning discovery number two was that Raphael Lemkin, your namesake, mm -hmm. spelt in exactly the same way, um, had also studied at the same university, and he was the man who invented the word genocide. So I thought, that is really weird. What was going on in that city in the 1920s and the 1930s? That the men who created the concepts of crimes against humanity and genocide, the very matters that I was going to address, the very matters that touch my professional life as a barrister, had come from that university, and why did the university not know about it? So that really meant something was mm. going on. And, and Lauterbrecht, he doesn't, he can't st stay there because he can't complete his final exams because he's Jewish. Yep. Yes, I do want to get into the other person from um, the same place, Leon, and, and your grandmother Rita. But how does Lauterbrecht go from there? to having a central role at Nuremberg? Lauterpacht is the greatest international lawyer of the 20th century, not just in my view, but in many people's views. He was born in a small town called Zhulkiev in 1897. He moved with his family 
to Lemberg in 1911. He enrolled at the law school in 1915. He takes his first degree there, doesn't complete because there's a numerous clauses limiting the number of Jews and actually Ukrainians and others, so it was just a purely sort of anti-Jewish thing. Um, and he then goes to Vienna, where he studies with Hans Kelsens, one, one of the great legal philosophers. And from there, he moves to London in 1923 and Cambridge in 1937. By then, he's written several books, and he is focusing on the place of the individual in international law. He is one of the founders of modern human rights law. He writes the first ever legal book on uh, international human rights. It's called The International Bill of Rights of Man, which is published in 1945. His family moves to the United States during the war for reasons of safety, his wife, Rachel, and his son, Ellie. Ellie happens to be my first teacher of international law many years later at Cambridge University. Again, the coincidences <coughs> multiply. And um, he goes to the United States, and he's introduced to Robert Jackson. And he writes large parts of Robert Jackson's famous Lend-Lease speech, allowing, uh, sorry, not, the, not the Lend-Lease speech. He's Attorney General when he meets him? He's Attorney General, not the Lend-Lease speech, the speech on how the United States can get around the neutrality rules. Um, Jackson's having trouble with all the American international lawyers who don't want to get involved in the war. He turns to Lauterpacht. In 45, Jackson works with Lauterpacht on the Nuremberg Statute, and Lauterpacht is then hired by the British and he pushes for crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity refers to essentially the protection, the crime of killing large numbers of individuals. And I think the judges know both Lauterbracht and Lemkin, don't they? But just to backtrack to Lemkin, they do have one lecturer in common back in, uh, back in Lemberg. The, so j j just to complete the story in terms of the parallel path, so Lemkin follows Lauterpacht at the university. They don't overlap. Lem Lauterpacht leaves in 1919. Lemkin arrives in 1921 and stays there for five years uh, and then becomes a public prosecutor in Warsaw and um, then is, uh, when the Germans invade, he escapes eventually to Sweden and then to the United States. It's a vastly complex and actually very interesting story on how he escapes, and makes it to Duke University. And there, he starts thinking about the crimes that have been committed. Um, and his focus is different from Lauterpacht's. The essence of genocide, the word he invents in his book, Axis Rule, published also in 1944-45, chapter 9 is called Genocide. Uh, he takes it from an amalgam of uh, Greek and uh, Latin words, uh, is not the protection of individuals, but the protection of groups. And Lemkin is then hired by Robert Jackson. So there are two teams in parallel. One, the British team, one, the American team. There are also the French and Soviet teams. And uh, I was, of course, unaware of this when I started researching um, the lecture that I was going to go. I was never intending to write a book. And was astonished by, by the two men's connections to uh, Lviv, the city, and the university. So having made those connections, of course, I, I'm a litigator, so I deal with a lot of evidence, and once I've got the bit between the teeth, I'm not going to let go. So, of course, as a teacher of law, I want to know who, what happened in that city, in that period that caused this to happen. And that meant, firstly, finding out what courses they took. I wanted to know what courses they took. And that took actually two years to discover. And Who, we, who helps you do that? How do you find that so out? So I find two fantastic Ukrainian PhD students who, who are just wonderful. Ivan and Igor, who are com literally, I mean, you couldn't invent them. They are wonderful, smart people. And bless them, they did hundreds of hours of research. I tried and tried and tried to pay them. And they literally would not, for them, they just said, it's a great honor to work for you. We, so I found other ways to, to, to support them in their careers as, as they've gone forward subsequently. So, so our, our, our detective work, and this is sort of a lot of detective work, is trying to find their student records. And it was one of those hallelujah moments when we found their student records. It was an amazing thing to find the actual documents signed by them, the lists of their courses, their grades. We found them in the, archi in the archive, the city archive, which is the sort of the deep dungeon of a sort of Dominican monastery in the heart of the city, water-stained, damaged, one of those just amazing moments when all the leather-bound books get brought up and you plough through them and you find Lauterpacht and you find Lemkin. 
So I spend a lot of time with Igor and Ivan going through their student records, the classes they took, amazingly named courses. So my favorite Lauterpacht course is the course he took on yeah, instinctivism versus pragmatism. You know, the idea that you would study that at law, in a law class, is wonderful. And I do the list of courses, and I end up homing in on the man who taught them criminal law. Uh, as I explain in the book why I focused on him, a man called Julius Makarevich, who's a very famous Polish uh, lawyer and a very famous Polish criminal lawyer. He's the father of Poland's modern uh, criminal code dating back to the 1930s, still has its influence today. And the remarkable thing about Makarevich, who was born Jewish but then converted to Catholicism, um, you know, you think of yourself as a teacher, one of the great joys in life is the hope that if this were a classroom, there would be one amongst you who would somehow be influenced by you and go off and do some great thing that is, uh, helps humanity. And Makarevich did that, but he did that by unintended means. Actually, both Lauterpacht and Lemkin took the path they did as a sort of backlash against his views. Mm. Because <laughs> he was a fervent Polish nationalist who basically thought, you know, Ukrainians and Jews should not be living in border areas and they should be expelled if they misbehave. And so the class actually that he given, that he gave, must have turned them against his views. <laughs> so he is their influence. He's but not experience. in the way he would have wanted. Um, look, I want to get into Raphael Lemkin's detective work as well, because that his collation of all those documents, which I think begins in Sweden. But there are two names that pop up. One uh, is Bob Silvers, the legendary New York Review of Books editor, who actually recounts something, I think, that Lemkin is originally taught. And then the, man, the woman that Lauterbrecht employs as a housekeeper yeah. in Vienna. Yeah, I mean... You'll have picked up that I, I mean, as a litigator, you have to pay attention to detail. You, you take a document and you just study, study, study a single piece of paper and you find things in that piece of paper. So I'm very attracted by points of detail. And the book, I think the reason the book has done, one of the reasons the book has done well, apart from the fact that it is published at a moment when Europe may be on the cusp of heading back to the 1930s, I'm quite sure that that is why in Britain and why it's been bought in so many languages across Europe. It's because the moment, the zeitgeist right now in Europe is not, it's not a good moment. But it's these extraordinary points of detail. And I remember I, I occasionally do articles for the New York Review of Books, and so I know Bob Silvers. And I was having, he said, what are you writing on? What are you working on? I said, oh, I'm sort of, you know, I went off to Lviv and I got really interested in it. And actually, it's become a book, the lives, the interweaving lives of these people. He said, oh, who are they? And I said, Lemkin. He said, Lemkin, Raphael Lemkin. I said, yeah. He said, oh, I was his research assistant in 1949. <laughs> he taught me at Yale University. Bob Silver st studied law for one year and then failed. <laughs> um, and Lemkin taught him a course on genocide in 1949 at Yale Law School. He said, I went down to Washington and he hired me as his research assistant. And that's all in the book. And he showed me all the documents. But what isn't in the book <laughs> is that um, he then said that... Uh, that Lemkin did, failed to pay him. <laughs> and he spent much of the next year trying to get the $20 or whatever it was that he was owed because he was a sort of impecunious law student. So that was one point of connection. The other point of connection was that going through, I, I was very privileged to have access to Hirsch Lauterpacht's entire correspondence and materials because we'll come on to the, the fairly amazing coincidences that I was completely unaware of l later, I hope. But, um, I'd mentioned that Elie Lauterpacht, his only child, his son, born in 1928 in London, in Cricklewood, uh, was my teacher. And so I knew Elie, and Elie was very important in my life because he's my mentor. He got me my first job at Cambridge University in 1984. So I love Elie, who got, really got my international law career going. And so I had access to anything that I wanted on the Lauterpacht life. And going through the correspondence and the material, and Ellie himself has written a very lengthy biography of his father. It's a very different style from this book. This is a sort of detective book. Um, and Ellie's is an academic book. But in that book and in the materials, we learn that when Hirsch Lauterpacht uh, goes to uh, Vienna with his friends, and he gets very involved in Jewish life in Vienna, he has a responsibility to run a student dormitory and cafeteria. And they have to hire a new housekeeper. 
uh, and the housekeeper that they hired uh, shortly after he arrived in 1923 had a name that will be very familiar to you. Her name was um, Miss Paula Hitler, and it was actually, unbelievably, Adolf Hitler's sister. Uh, so the idea that, you know, you, you just find these extraordinary points of connection uh, in history that blow you away. Look, let's, um, I want to get back, of course, to Ladbrecht and Lemkin, but um, Leon and Rita, your grandparents and your mother, Ruth, uh, should we start with, well, let's start about them being divided between Vienna and Paris and with Elsie Tilney. Sure. So just some, I'm not going to give absolutely everything away because I would like you to buy the book, possibly, <laughs> and, and, or borrow friends and read it. Um, He'll be signing it afterwards. But the family history in a nutshell is my grandfather's born in 1904. He uh, has um, a brother and two sisters. Uh, they live in Lemberg. The First World War breaks out. His brother is enrolled in the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire Army. He dies in the Great Battle of Lemberg. Interestingly, the New York Times of September 1914 describes the Battle of Lemberg as the greatest holocaust in human history. A million people killed uh, in the space of just a few weeks. And one of those killed is Leon's uh, brother. Following that, his father dies of a broken heart. The family leaves. He goes with his mum and his two sisters to Vienna and sets up his life in Vienna. It's not an educated family. There was no university. Everyone's in the, in the basically the, the, the alcohol trade. That's the world that they, that they inhabit. And of course, then things start going badly wrong in Europe in the 1930s. And my grandfather gets married to Rita in 1937 in May. And a year later, my mother is born in July 1938. Now, the family history then, what happened was shrouded in mystery for me. No one really wanted to talk about it. Um, I knew only that they'd all ended up in Paris, and I'd assumed they had gone together to Paris, but they had not gone together to Paris, as I learned from this material that my mother gave me, because I found their passports, so I could work out they travelled on different dates. My grandfather leaves in January 1939 by himself. Question, why would someone leave without their six-month-old child and without their wife when they've all got passports and they can all get out. My mother follows six months later in July 1939 and makes her way to Paris as a one-year-old infant. So, okay, how did that happen? Who took her? Question number two, who took my mum to Paris? And question number three, which has been a big issue, of course, in my mother's life, why did my grandmother stay behind? I mean, I've learnt very much in these things. One does not judge any actions. We do not know why people took the decisions they did, and we can't substitute, and it would be wrong to do that. But it's a big question for a child. I'm a parent. You know, the idea of leaving your child, or your child going and you staying behind is, is, is a very complex and, and painful and difficult one. My grandmother stayed behind and did not go to Paris until 1942. Uh, so what happened there? Why did she stay behind? How did she get out? How on earth does a Jewish woman get from Vienna to Paris in 1942? So essentially, the book is two detective stories. One is the very personal family one, and the other is the very public intellectual one, Crimes Against Humanity and Genocide, and the interweaving of those two stories, which essentially come together in my life because I happen to do the work of Crimes Against Humanity and Genocide. I spend a huge amount of time trying to answer these questions, and I find all the answers. Um, <laughs> so they are some of the best bit, bits of the book, and I, I don't want to spoil the book, but there are, I mean, there's three people. There's Elsie Tilney, who I mentioned. There's Emile, and there's, there's Mackie. Do you want to mention, let's, I'll leave let, it up to you, to, well, which of yeah, those you want to mention? Yeah, let's just say, um, let's just give a couple of, of, of just so to give you a feel. In the two briefcases, suitcases, small suitcase things, I, I find a tiny slip of paper. It measures about an inch and a half by one inch. And on it, it says, simply in pencil, in a very firm, angular handwriting, Miss E.M. Tilney, 
Manuka, Bluebell Road, Norwich, Angleterre. And I say to my mum, what's this? She says, I don't know. I said, come on, it's been here for 70 years. Someone kept this piece of paper. There must be a reason. She said, I don't know. I, I don't know. I said, no, no. I, the, who, who was? She said, she says, well, maybe it was the woman who carried me from Vienna to Paris. Okay. So I then engage. It takes me two and a half, three years to find out who Miss E. M. Tilney is. And it's a story that moves me very, very deeply. I owe my existence to Miss E. M. Tilney. Miss E. M. Tilney turned out to be an evangelical Christian missionary from Norwich, England, a member of uh, an outfit called the Surrey Chapel, which still exists today, who have become my dear friends because I suddenly turned up at their doorstep announcing that my mum had been saved by Miss E. M. Tilney. Born in 1893 goes on mission to North Africa to bring Muslims and Jews to Jesus. No evidence of any success. <laughs> um, but this requires her to spend a lot of time in Paris, because to get from Norwich to North Africa, you'd go by train and boat, and you would pass through Paris. And so in the 1930s, start spending a lot of time in Paris. And by the mid-1930s, Jewish refugees and other refugees against the Nazi regime are turning up in Paris, and she begins to work with a particular church, a Protestant church in Paris, which I find, and I've come to know the pastor there also and seen the archives there. And she will have met my grandfather, who would have said, I have a six-month-old daughter in Vienna, would you go and get her? And she does. And... Um, I've spent a lot of time working out why she did that. One of the people who helped me a lot do that was a writer who you will know, Jeanette Winterson, uh, whose mother was also an evangelical Christian missionary, and I needed to understand what motivated someone like that to do what she did. And it turned out that I really owe my existence to a single line in Paul's letter to the That's Romans. Right. It's really remarkable. And there was a pastor at the Surrey Chapel in the 1930s called David Panton who had a particular interpretation of that line in Paul's letter to the Romans. The version that they had simply said, to the Jew first. And the interpretation of Elsie Tilney through David Panton was that that meant you had a moral and religious responsibility to do all you could to save Jews. And she devotes herself to doing that. After she saves my mum, I could have just stopped, but I got so interested in Elsie that I followed what happened to her life afterwards, and it's an incredible story. She's imprisoned by the Nazis for four years in Stalag 127, where she carries on doing even more amazing things. Uh, and the life just to end it, I then followed it all the way through to the end. It ends in Coconut Grove, Miami. Uh, she retires to be with her brother Fred, who is, you could not invent this, a bodybuilder. <laughs> Not any bodybuilder, but actually the man who discovered Charles Atlas, who is his best friend. Mm. And the idea that the lady who saved my mum's life sort of is hanging out in Miami with Charles Atlas, I love that. I just <laughs> love that. Uh, taking me back to the Marvel comics yeah. of my youth. Look, let's... Um, there was always Charles Atlas ads in the old comic books. Let's go to Nuremberg. Um, so the, I think there are about 100,000 people in Lemberg at the start mm. of World War II and less than 1,000 survive. We really need to talk about Hans Frank, the butcher of Warsaw, and the glove at the trial, um, and your, your investigations with right. him. So family. I had no reason to think about Hans Frank, except that as I... So I go to Lviv for the first time in October 2010, and I sort of fall in love with the place. You know, in that weird way, it's a dark place, but it feels like a home of sorts. There's a sort of some connection. This is the place that got me going in some unknown way on crimes against humanity and genocide and did terrible things to my grandfather's family. Of course, what I learned, what I didn't know, was that in 1939, my grandfather had about 80 members of his family in Lemberg and in Zhulkiev. What I didn't know was that by 1945, he was the last one alive. He was the only one alive. So that was a pretty big, um, a, a pretty big 
uh, discovery. I keep, um, I keep going back. What I then learn is that things got really bad for the Jews. I mean, they were already bad, but they got really bad in the summer of 1942. Some of you were at the Alan Misson oration yesterday, so you will know what happened, that Hans Frank arrives on the 1st of August 1942, gives a big speech saying, without using the words, I'm going to implement the final solution uh, in Lemberg and basically kill everybody. And he's personally weeks. appointed by Hitler. He's Hitler's he lawyer. He has been Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer. Um, uh, from 1928 to 1933. So all the big cases he's done for Hitler. And I got to know Hans Frank very well because I reached out to his son, who has become actually a friend, um, Nicholas. And so I've got a lot of the inside material from his mother's diary, from the correspondence between the father and the mother, which is really remarkable and interesting material. And of course... Hans Frank then becomes the point of connection between my family and the Lauterpacht and Lemkin family because what my grandfather Lemkin and Lauterpacht have in common is they basically lose absolutely everybody uh, as a result of the actions of Hans Frank. So I become very fascinated uh, about Hans Frank. I, sh I should just say, just to, uh, this is perhaps a moment to uh, explain the, the points of connection that are, in a sense, overwhelming. I learn, I, I'd mentioned that Lauterpacht had been born in the small town of Zhulkiev, about 25 kilometers to the west of Lviv in uh, 1897. And I find the house, uh, or the space, because there's no house there anymore, where he was born in the street on which he lived. What I later discover is that my great-grandmother, my grandfather Leon's mother, uh, Amalia, was born in Zhulkiev. And not only was she born in the same town as uh, Hirsch Lauterpacht, but she lived on the same street as Hirsch Lauterpacht, whose son will become my teacher, which is, seems pretty weird. Um, and the street is East-West Street, uh, referred to by Joseph Roth in some of his writings, that every street, every one of these small towns has an East-West Street. It is the East-West Street which was Lemberger Straße. So, so my great-grandmother starts life. The first street she ever walks on is Lauterpack Street. And the last street she ever walks on, Himmelfahrtstrasse at Treblinka, which is the street to heaven, the street that links the railway platform to the gas chamber, which she walks down on the 23rd of September 1942 as part of the same convoy as the three elderly sisters of Sigmund Freud. But two weeks later, Bella and Joseph Lemkin walk down exactly the same street. So in a strange way, my intellectual and professional life, which is so informed by the work of Lauterpacht and Lemkin, is also in this odd personal way bookended from beginning mm -hmm. to end. I mean, you really couldn't invent it. I had no idea about any of this when I started. And progressively, it was pretty surprising. I have to say, my wife is a skeptic about coincidence. Um, <laughs> not after reading that, I'm, she's not. She is, she is. She says, oh, if you go to the cinema, basically six people in the cinema will have relatives who were born on East West Street. And, <laughs> uh, Kiev. and so she's the skeptic in the family. I'm oh. the one who's, no, it means something, there's something going on, who knows how all these things happen. Uh, I do actually believe that. I do think, I do think that it's not just entirely total coincidence that Hirsch Lauterpacht plucks me out of you know, a cohort of 100 students in, a, in the 30 years of the, that he's had of his teaching and brings me into... Something's going on. It's a, who, who knows what it is, but mm. that's what I think. Let's go to Nuremberg to the trials, and neither Lauterpacht or Lemkin, I think, know while the trial's going on what's happened to their families. But Hans Frank's diaries are... A crucial, which I, I think that's really worth talking about, <laughs> the, the amazing things that are in his diaries, and then have, perhaps we can go to how successful, I guess, both Lemkin and Lauterbrecht are with genocide and crimes against humanity. Can I say something about the writing of the book? Because oh. be, be, Just before we get to the question of the diaries, this was an immensely challenging book to write. I, I mean, I, I love writing, I do big briefs. Uh, this was almost overwhelmingly difficult. You're, you're dealing with four different stories each of which has their own track. Um, when I first wrote it, before it had a book contract, I started the story in 1914, 
and told it then in chronological order all the way up to 1946. But interweaving from 1914 the four stories so that there'd be a section on Lauterpacht and then I'd go to my grandfather and then Lemkin and then Frank. And it was bought by a wonderful editor at Alfred Knopf, marvelous publisher in the United States. And it was edited out of America by Alfred Knopf uh, and by Victoria Wilson, to whom I pay real credit. And she said, I buy it on one condition. She said, instantly, I buy this book, but I buy it on one condition. It has to be completely restructured. <laughs> because the human brain cannot cope with so much information presented in that way. It was really interesting. She said, no, the information's all fine, and the stories are all fine, but you've got to tell it in a different way. She said, this is how you will tell it, and you have to tell me now, this is how you will tell it, or I won't buy it. First, you will deal with your grandfather's story from 1914 to the beginning of the Nuremberg trial. Then you will deal with Lauterpacht's story. Then you will deal with Lemkin's story. And fourth part, you will deal with Hans Frank's story because the human brain can cope with one person's story following it through. And then the book will go into essentially its second total different direction, which is bringing the lives together from 19, 1945 and 1946, because the human brain can cope with a year of interweaving lives. It <laughs> can't cope with 30 years of interweaving lives. And it's just a genius act of editorial work. She was so, I resisted it at first, but. She was so completely right. Thank and God so the, the second half of the book is this, I think, well, it's a completely unknown story of two prosecutors, Lemkin and Lauterpacht, Lemkin with the Americans prosecuting for genocide, Lauterpacht with the British prosecuting for crimes against humanity, and they're prosecuting Hans Frank. They do not know when the trial opens, what the fate of their families is. They learn it in the last weeks of the trial in the summer of 1946, and they discover, again, you could not invent it, that the man they are prosecuting is the man who's killed their entire families. Now, in domestic terms today, I was talking yesterday, I think, or in Sydney the other day with a uh, public prosecutor. We were laughing about the idea of, if, if I were to discover that I was involved in a case today prosecuting someone who had killed my own family. You just remove yourself from the case instantly. Straight conflict of interest. You cannot, you just, you, you're not object, you can't possibly be objective. But of course that was 1945, it was the first ever international criminal trial, a stupendous moment in, in legal history. The, probably the greatest, certainly the greatest trial in international law ever, and probably one of the great trials in human history. And they carry on. And I discover in the archives references to their obsession with Frank. Some of you will have seen that in the, in the, in the, in the oration that I gave yesterday. I, you know, in the Columbia archive, I find a single piece of paper in Lemkin's, Lemkin's archives, not much left. And he's written out the word genocide dozens of times on a piece of paper, crossed them all out, and then only after I'd looked at this paper a hundred times did I notice that right in the middle of the piece of paper he'd written the word Frank and then crossed it out. And so you, that, 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 a piece of paper like that just opens up the imagination. You can imagine him sitting somewhere, scribbling, doodling, writing away, thinking about legal issues, but actually what he's really thinking about is his family and the man who killed his entire family, and he's prosecuting him. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a book of imagination. It's a book, for me, it's a book that catalyzed my imagination. The law can be very dry and very turgid and very horrible. But actually, the law is completely fascinating because the law is just about human beings dealing with cases and dealing with facts. And at every stage of this, I came to understand that you cannot fully comprehend how a trial like Nuremberg took place, or indeed any trial, without understanding the personalities behind it and the lives of the individuals that are involved in a case. It's mm. about human interactions. It's about stories, and human interactions are absolutely vital. Now, a lot of people resist that idea. Historians are very uncomfortable in some quarters with going into the personal on these issues, but I think what I've taken from this whole experience 
is to understand what Lauterpacht and Lemkin did, to understand how crimes against humanity and genocide became part of our world, you have to know the personal stories because you can't fully comprehend without knowing that. Yeah. Look, there's so much about all of their personal stories, by the way, and, and a lot about their sexuality of various people in the book that are really fascinating, particularly given where we are now, I think, in the modern world. It turned out everyone was gay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not even that simple, is it? It's not even that simple. I mean, they're much more diverse than that. Or could be gay. Could be, yeah. yeah. I'm ambiguous about it because I treat my evidence fairly. Yeah, you don't, you don't actually make a judgment. There's some really complete lack of judgment there. But I just, I mean, I think the task, the, ta the task is to lay out the material. Yeah. You know, readers are intelligent. Readers mm. will form their own view. I, I don't think, and I don't, I didn't want to impose views and solutions on anybody. I think each of you here, when you read a book, you interpret things in particular ways. You've got your own experiences that you bring to bear to these materials and it was not for me to um, it was not for me to impose my interpretation so what I chose to do was perch myself on certain facts um, just to take Lebkin no intimate relationship discoverable in his entire life I find his nephew Saul in Montreal, he says, no, I never knew of anything. We never knew of any love, interest, male or female, nothing at all. So you pick up the tiny pieces of information that you can find in his memoir, unpublished at the time, but which Donna Lee Fries, wonderful Donna Lee Fries, who's here somewhere, fantastically well edited and made available to the world. There's this tiny little line where he describes when he was a young man in Vilnius going for a walk on a hill with a girl and she tries to kiss him, and then something inexplicable came over him, and they didn't kiss. What does that mean? Who knows what that means? Who knows what, what was going on there? But then you link that to the fact that the only group, Lemkin, who invents the concept of genocide, is obsessed with all groups, which is the only group he never writes about, or never mentions, and never uses the word, despite the fact that he's got all the Nazi decrees on the criminality of homosexuals, as it was called in those days. He never uses the word homosexual anywhere. So like, what is that about? And then, right at the end of the research, again through Donna Lee, to whom I pay real tribute for her generosity, I'm introduced to an extraordinary woman called Nancy Steinson, uh, a New York lady, extraordinarily wonderful woman. One of the side things that I've learned from this research project is people in their 80s and 90s are fabulous. I have met so many fabulous people. Nancy, you know, leading amongst them. And I come to know Nancy. Nancy describes how in the summer of 1959 she was in at Riverdale Park in um, Manhattan. She was a young first year student at Barnard College and in Columbia. And she's having a picnic with a friend and a disheveled old fellow comes up to her, sees them having a picnic, and says, I can say I love you in 20 languages. And it's Raphael Lemkin. And she comes to know Raphael Lemkin, and she becomes his research assistant and helps him type up his memoir and his confidant. And she says to me one day, you know, I have his poems. I said, poems? He wrote poems? She said, yes, he wrote poems, and I have copies of all of them. I said, I'd love to see that. And she sends me his poems, which have never been published. I think he was not a poet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I read the poems very attentively, and an, I come across the first one, which is a love poem. But it's a love poem between one man, he and he, two men, it seems. So I think, oh, well, it's typographical, the typewriter didn't, left out the S. But no, you then come to a second poem, which has the same thing, where it's essentially clearly between two men. And I think, ha, huh, that's really interesting. Now, is it for me to say that definitely means X or Y? No, it's not. You'll read it, you'll read the poem for yourself, you'll contextualize it yourself, and you'll form your own views as to what it does and doesn't mean. It's not for me to impose my, I have views, but but you'll all form your own view about such matters. Look, it's a delightful book. I do want to try and draw a strong opinion from you now, though, because it is essentially about the establishment of international law. And I first uh, heard 
who you were when you were tearing apart the arguments or the pseudo arguments put forward by Tony Blair's Attorney General Lord and John Goldsmith, Howard and John Howard's as well. Um, so look, I'm, I'm interested. W was this the high, was Nuremberg the high watermark of for international law, or was was it the beginning of something great? Because you've gone forensically through the Chilcot mm. Inquiry, which was trying to examine what Britain did and didn't do mm. in the lead up to the Iraq War mm. and, and the aftermath. Was this when it worked best, or is it still something that has great utility and great potential? Nuremberg was flawed justice, and it was, to a certain extent, Victor's justice. There's no getting away from that. But all roads today, in terms of international criminal justice, lead to Nuremberg. Every single case and trial that has happened subsequently, and every single claim and allegation leads inexorably and directly to the Nuremberg trial. If Nuremberg had not happened, we would not have the system of modern international criminal justice. And so the question arises, have the subsequent developments met expectations? And of course they have not. Uh, Robert Jackson's speech, for those of you interested, go onto YouTube. If you want to watch one of the great legal speeches ever given, go onto YouTube and just type in Jackson Nuremberg opening and watch Robert Jackson's opening speech. It's extraordinary. But he says, never again, never again will we allow this to happen. And of course, we open our newspapers today, we see what's going on in Aleppo and Syria and northern Iraq and various the horrors around the world, uh, too numerous to mention uh, right now. And we know that it hasn't worked. And what I say to my students is it's a long game. You know, for millennia, the sovereign was supremely powerful. Until 1939, as a matter of international law, a state was entirely free to kill as many members of its population as it wished. If you wanted to kill all Christians or Muslims or Jews or all women over 45 or all men between 32 and 39 or whatever, you could do it. There was no rule of international law that said you couldn't do it. And what happened in 1945, the combo of Nuremberg, the UN Charter, was they said, OK, international law is going to change. States are no longer absolutely sovereign. There are limitations on the rights of the state. And that is a revolutionary moment. And it is going to take a lot more than 70 years for states to change their behavior and for governments to state their behavior. So it's a work in progress. It has been followed, of course, by Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and other international criminal tribunals. And now the International Criminal Court, which is fraught with difficulty and faces huge political problems as well as uh, legal difficulties. But I'm an optimist, as you will have picked up from seeing me in action today, and I have to believe that it was nevertheless a moment of vital importance, a revolution, a transformation, and we just have to carry on, you know, three steps forward, two steps back, four steps sideways, five steps backwards, six steps forward, and keep working at it, and uh, it's a long game. I want to leave question and answer time, but a specific question. Where are um, the former Prime Ministers, Tony Blair and John Howard, where might they still have questions to answer when it comes to international law in Iraq? Well, the Deputy Legal Advisor at the Foreign Office, the wonderful Elizabeth Wilmshurst, who resigned uh, oh, in yeah. March 2003, in her resignation letter, which I made public in my book Lawless World, published now back in 2005, described the war in Iraq as a crime of aggression, uh, the implication being that there was individual criminal responsibility for what had happened. The Chilcot report has come. It has avoided expressing a view on legality, but it's plain uh, that that is the direction that it is taking. Uh, my own view has been clear from the get-go. The war was illegal. It was not authorised under international law. And there are and should be consequences for that. Now, whether those consequences include criminal liability and criminal responsibility is, of course, a matter on which reasonable people will disagree. Um, I think what can be said is that someone like Tony Blair will choose his travel plans very, very carefully. There is no jurisdiction at the International Criminal Court for the crime of aggression in relation to Iraq, so he does not face a risk there. But some countries do have the crime of aggression in their domestic statutes, and there is theoretically, at least, that possibility. You know, it was very interesting. I, was at, I spent the whole day at Westminster 
on the day the Chilcot report was published. It was a febrile atmosphere, although it came just after the Brexit vote. And so, you know, the tension was slightly <coughs> diffused. But there was a huge amount of attention. And people were really stunned by the Chilcot report. Expectations had been low. I have to say my expectations were low, and I was stunned by the report. Uh, I, I've summarised what the report says in an article that I've written on for the London Review of Books, which, if you're interested in, is freely available on the LRB website. And most stunned of all were the families of servicemen and women who had been killed or injured, who had very low expectations. And the, the Chilcot speaks for half an hour, the report is released, and you feel you're, they're around there in Westminster. You're standing with them, talking with them. And I did a couple of TV interviews with them, and they were just... They just felt that's it. They've, they've had their moment. They've had their day in court. They've been vindicated. And then at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Tony Blair took to the airwaves and spoke for more than two hours, um, basically like a half-crazed man. I mean, everyone was, whoa, what is up with him? And a number of people have said he did what he did on legal advice, that he has to defend what he did, because to even open up a chink would expose him to even greater legal risks. I don't know if that is true, but a number of well-informed people have speculated uh, that. But it was a very sad moment, because I think what the country as a whole needed to happen... I mean, Iraq has been defining, I think, for the United Kingdom. Iraq will come to be seen as the moment the United Kingdom ceased to be an international actor in a truly powerful sense. It, it, and Brexit, there's a straight line for me from Iraq to Brexit. It's absolutely about withdrawing from the international uh, and retreating into your sort of inner shell and your inner being. And that, um, you know, moment when Chilcot happened was a moment for Tony Blair to say, you know what, with the benefit of hindsight, I now realize I got it wrong. And I expressed my apologies to that, and in particular, I express my apologies to the people of Iraq and to all the British servicemen and women who were killed or injured, maimed in a war which was fought wrongly and which we now know was wrong. And he didn't do that. And a great moment was lost. It was a great sort of healing moment that could have happened. And I, people like me, would then back off and say, OK, fine, you know, let him travel around the world, let him give his multi-billion dollar lectures and whatever and leave him alone. We get on with our lives and he said he got it wrong. And he hasn't done it. And so that has incensed people. And so it goes on, and now they want to bring legal actions and misfeasance in public office and various other things. And I'm really sorry about that, because I think a wiser, bigger individual would have taken the moment and said, the well-being of the community as a whole requires him to accept that he made a mistake, and he won't do it. And I gather John Howard, you, you told me you interviewed John Howard, and he's done the same thing. They simply won't accept that they got it wrong. They simply won't accept that they created ISIS. They simply won't accept that the mess we now face is a consequence of a catastrophic decision. And Chilcot, to give Sir John Chilcot absolutely credit, calls it a catastrophic decision. Mm. And it is plainly catastrophic. Well, and look, backed up by people like... Um, we've got a very well-known military man, David Kilcullen. The Australian Army ended up advising Condoleezza Rice. He calls it the greatest strategic blunder since Hitler decided to take on Russia. So everyone except people like Tony That's Barrett, the I link with East West Street. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well done, it's great. <laughs> look, it is a great book, but I want to give everybody uh, a chance to ask your questions. By the way, President Obama's the founder of ISIS. Just oh, yeah, so you're you know. right. Yes. I forgot about that. Um, yeah. So keep that in mind. Yeah. And Hillary Clinton was the midwife or something like that. Um, but if you've got a question, um, I know I've, I've still got many questions. I've pursued my own, or I've tried to pursue my own family story in Europe and haven't done nearly enough, but do we have a microphone? Yeah, just do wait for the microphone. It just means that everybody can hear your question. Maybe just hand it down and people will pass it just to the lady with the red scarf and then we'll go from there. Oh. Nah. I'll just speak out. No worries. When you're dealing in a trial with a delusional witness... <laughs> Happens every day. Well, um, what do you mean by delusional witness? Someone that, that won't accept facts themselves. I, I, I mean, 
I mean, that, well, that, that, that would be a delusional defendant rather than a delusional witness. But, I mean, I mean essentially, once, for, for me, once I've formed a view that an individual can't be relied on to provide credible testimony, I'm just going to stop. I don't think it's a useful function to uh, open up that type of evidence in a, in, 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 a, in a proceeding. But different people have different views. And it turns on the particular case. Um, there's a gentleman there with his hand up. Let's see if we can get it. Oh, that one's working. There you go. Hi. Firstly, I want to compliment you on the book. It's the most amazing amount of research. The way you followed every single faded photograph and every little note like that Miss Tilney's and tied it into a network, a connection that reached all the way back to the start of the 20th century and from there all the way to today. Just amazing. Well done. Thank you. There's one little thing that bothered me, and perhaps I'm wrong. Just the one. Just the one, yeah, just the one. Uh, the two legal brains that came up with the concepts of crime against humanity and genocide, they seem to be so concerned with the terminology being used in the indictment and the sentencing that to me it seems like they failed to see the big picture of the actual crimes that happened. I mean, Melbeck, uh, Limbeck, he mentions at one time that it was the blackest day of his life because genocide wasn't mentioned in one of the Russians or one of the yeah. sentencing indictments. And everybody, most, almost everybody is sentenced to hang. And he thinks it's the blackest day of his life because he didn't mention genocide. I mean, is, right. that, the, right. is that the right thing? I, mean, I am so glad you've, that is really, that goes absolutely to the heart of this book. And, and I, I'm really grateful to you because you, you allow me to talk about something that we haven't talked about. The difference between crimes against humanity and genocide. Crimes against humanity is about the protection of individuals. Lauter Pact promoted it. He was totally against the concept of genocide, the protection of groups. Why? Because he said or believed that the focus on the protection of groups would undermine the well-being of individuals and it would end up replacing the tyranny of the state with the tyranny of groups and would pit one group against another group. And Lem can send in response to that, but no, 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 no. The fact is people get killed not because they are of their individual human qualities, but because they happen to be a member of a hated group. And so the law must reflect that reality. And so you've got two, I, I, I know exactly what you're saying, but you've got actually two fundamentally competing conceptions. How does the law operate its magic, its protective embrace? Does it focus on us, each of us in this room and around the world, because of our individual human qualities as individuals? Or does it protect us because we're a member of a group which is entitled to protection? And that question goes to the heart of, in a sense, philosophy, human existence. Who am I? Who are you? You're an individual, but you're also a member of many different groups. How are you to be defined in the law? Are you to be defined as Mr. X, individual? Or are you to be defined as Mr. X, member of group Y? And to be protected not because of your human qualities, but in order to safeguard a group. And that is a huge, huge question that in a sense, Subconsciously or not, we all ask ourselves, who are we and how do we want to be validated? So to give you a, a practical example of why this makes a difference, right now one of the cases that I'm involved in and making a new film about is the treatment of Yazidi women in northern Iraq. Okay? And I'm working very closely with an extraordinary German psychologist who has set up a program to bring 1,100 Yazidi women from northern Iraq to Germany for psychological treatment in the face of each of them having been raped hundreds of times, hundreds of times, to, to spend time with a group of 20, 12-year-olds who've been raped hundreds of times, I have to tell you, is one of the most painful things I've ever been through. And one of the things that the psychologist wants them to have is a belief in the future. And belief in the future comes with belief that justice might be done. And so the psychologist says to me, Philippe, what is very, very important to these people is the idea that one day justice could be done and that the people who did these terrible things to them might be hauled up before a tribunal or killed. Some of them just want them killed, some of them want them before a court. 
And he says, Philippe, what's really important is what the crime is called. And he says, we don't want crimes against humanity or war crimes. We want genocide. Why do we want genocide? We want genocide because this act was targeted against them as Yazidi women. And to call it genocide is a way of offering a legitimacy to their existence as a group. And that was essentially Lemkin's um, desire. So I, I, I can see exactly where you're coming from. And my starting point was, why does it matter what we call it? Why does it matter whether we call the killing of a million Armenians by the Ottoman Empire in 1915 genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, or whatever? Actually, it really matters. And one of the things that infuses the book is, on the one hand, I'm intellectually with Lauterpacht. I, I think he's right intellectually. In an ideal world, each of us in this room has value as an individual and should be respected for that reason. But I'm equally with Lemkin in recognizing that we will not be killed because of our individual qualities. We'll be killed because we are Muslim or Christian or Yazidi or Jewish or black or white or yellow or woman or male or gay or transgender or whatever it might be. And the law must respect that. And you will see as you read the book, it is only right at the end that I come off the fence. But I come off the fence apparently so subtly that I have had many emails asking me what the last line in the book means. So thank you for your question. It goes to the heart of why I wrote this book. Because actually, this book asks a question, who am I? That's really what it's about. This gentleman there, the glasses. Do you want to just hand it over? Um, Philippe, I'd like to ask you a personal question. Your book is clearly a lot about your personal life and background and your family. And many of us in this room will have lost one or both parents. And many of us would love to have asked our parents things that we never did. Now, I heard you on Radio National the other day and you talked about the fact that this is something your father never talked about. A grandfather. A grandfather. Yeah. This period of time. And I'm not sure quite how much your mother talked about. So I just want to ask you two questions. Do you wish you'd pushed them harder than you did? And secondly, what would you have liked to have asked them? Mm. Uh, another wonderful question, two wonderful questions. So I knew my grandfather really well. He was born in 1904. He died in 1997. So he, I was 36 years old when he died. So I spent a lot of time with him. I was very, very close with him. He lived in Paris, I lived in London, but I, I, I was very, very close to him. And as a child growing up, my brother and I have talked about this a lot, we grew up in an environment where it's never said, don't ask about that, don't. But children know, children know. And, um, and there's a quote in here that really, for me, is central in explaining why I started to write this book. I asked a psychoanalyst friend. I, I had a sense there was something in my relationship with my grandfather that I didn't fully understand that, he, that I wanted to know more about. And I asked a psychoanalyst friend, is there any work by psychoanalysts, not on the relationship between parent and child, which I know to be very well written about, but between grandparent and grandchild? And she said, oh, yes, yes, you must read the work of Maria Torok and Nicholas Abraham. They have focused their lives on this transgenerational stuff. And so I read myself in. And one of the th and they tell incredible stories with their patients uh, of how they find their thesis is essentially a grandparent communicates to a grandchild in ways that are not fully understood, but having gone through a trauma the grandparent then communicates aspects of that trauma, not to the child, but to the grandchild, which is really interesting. And there's one quote that I begin with in the book uh, by Nicholas Abraham, notes on the phantom in 1975. What haunts are not the dead, but the gaps left within us by the secrets of others. And I think as a child, in an unspoken, uncommunicated, orally, verbal way, we know things have happened and have gone on and we are touched by them and they affect us and they inform us. 
And I think that operated with me. And so I never once asked him about his mum and his sisters and all the family because I knew it was very painful. And he's operating effectively a protective embrace. He's basically saying, I don't want to talk about it because I want to protect you from the horror that I went through. And so you respect that. I would say the greatest regret I have in my life is that I never spoke to my grandfather about it, that I never once, I almost feel a sense of shame about it. I never once asked him about his mum. You know, like, what was she like? And was she a warm, friendly, lovely person or a horrible person? Like just whatever, you know. And uh, you can't rewind the clock. And that's what I really, really miss and regret. With my mum, it's more complex between parent and child, as many people in the room will know, and you learn to, to back off for other ways and other reasons. But I have to say, she did not want to explore these issues, and I respect that completely and understand that. But I very much appreciate that once I'd asked her for the two briefcases, she said, go, do it. And whatever you find, just keep me posted. And some of the stuff, as you will see, is very, very delicate. Uh, for her, much more delicate for her than for me, including issues of paternity, her paternity, um, which I couldn't deal with, but which are more complex for her. And so there's this way in which family members negotiate these kinds of things. But at the heart of your question is, d do I regret not having spoken to my grandfather? Absolutely. I, there's not a day passes where I can't. I don't even have a recording of his voice. I can't believe we never sat down. Uh, and just nattered and recorded it. I just, I'm so sad about that. Um, on the other hand, it respected him. That's what he wanted. Oh. And it was an act of respect to do that. But it it's, touches me very much, that, that issue. And I'm sure there are many other people in the room. I should say that this, the themes invoked here are not themes about Nazis and Jews. I think they're universal themes that, that happen in relation to these kinds of situations. I mean, I, you know, doing the cases that I've done in Rwanda and Yugoslavia and Congo and Iraq and Iran and Guantanamo and Israel and Palestine and all of these parts of the world, they, these are universal issues. That I've just explored them through one particular lens, but exactly the same thing happens. I have a very good friend in Jordan whose family... Palestinian expelled um, from the land of territory of Israel after 1947, lost everything and ended up now doing very, very well in Jordan. And I've had these conversations with him about how these generational things get, get passed on and it just tells the same story. He just remembers, he, he's the same age as me exactly and he just says, you know, my grandparents were the same. I was born, he says, in 1960 like you and I knew my grandparents had gone through a trauma and I just knew I wasn't allowed to talk about it and so I don't know. And, He's read the book and loves the book and says, I wish, I wish I could do what you've done. I don't have the materials. I don't have the documents. I don't have the time, whatever. So I think it's a universal set of issues that comes up. Mm. What a beautiful answer. I might have time for one more question. We're running a little over. Lady here. I apologise. My question is um, uh. somewhat insular and... Pragmatic, insular and pragmatic, <laughs> because that's where I am. We don't have much human rights architecture in our domestic legislation in this country. Um, a terrible absence of it, actually. As an international lawyer, can you um, give us some <laughs> of your wisdom concerning where we could pursue in an international forum the uh, problems, well, well, one, there are many, the indefinite arbitrary detention of people that is happening in this country right now. Uh, not only in offshore islands, but Christmas Island is a gulag. I was there last week. There are people there who face indefinite detention. And can you find for us some guidance or give us some ideas how we can uh, do something about this. Well, look, that's a very big question that would require hours and hours, and it's, I wish I could give you a simple hundred-word answer. I'm very familiar with what happens in Australia, as in other parts. Well, I, it happens that I spend a lot of time in Australia. I was counsel for Australia in the Whaling case, 
Um, so, I, you know, I have a lot of friends here. I've taught at Melbourne and at Sydney, and um, so I'm not a complete outsider. So I followed the debate very, very closely over the last few years, and I know the issue that you're talking about very well, and it's a horrendous issue. Um, and in the end, it's the sort of force of public opinion and the shaming by these terrible stories that is going to cause uh, a change. I mean, you have wonderful lawyers in Australia. I know many of them. I know they are leaving no stone unturned. I was with Julian Burnside last night, and there's nothing that I can bring that is new. I can't offer you a magic solution. What I can offer you is solidarity and let you know that those of you in Australia who are deeply anxious and concerned about what's going on have tremendous support uh, outside Australia, and we are working with many Australian friends in relation to those issues. So there's the political route, which is the shaming of an entire country, frankly, by um, things that are happening that are truly outrageous, truly outrageous and plainly illegal, plainly inconsistent. Uh, with the international norms that Australia contributed to dramatically and positively after 1945. Australia played a hugely important role in constructing the edifice of international human rights law and the international uh, criminal justice system. I mean, there is, of course, the possibility that these matters could be referred to the International Criminal Court. Uh, I think that there's a decent argument that what is happening on Christmas Island is a crime against humanity. Uh, and the treatment of these people. Wouldn't you have uh, to show that our courts had failed to get to the ICC? No, there's no... no um, you'd, ha you'd have to show that there's a sort of an unwillingness and a refusal uh, to prosecute. Right. Um, uh, and so that's the interface between the two. But the International Criminal Court, of course, faces similar claims in relation to the United Kingdom and the treatment of detainees, and it's a really difficult thing for an international court's prosecutor to take those kinds of issues. So, I, I mean, I, I, I wish I could give you a full and complete answer that satisfies you. It is a long game. Those of you who are going out and marching and visiting, carry on, because that is incredibly important. It gets picked up, it gets noticed, governments get shamed, and eventually, and there is a change, I think, that is now uh, going to take place, or, or, or will soon take place, because the pressure is overwhelming. And, and so don't give up just because the international law system is failing to be effectively enforced. Make the international law system better. This, you know, perhaps is the moment to, to just evoke and to conclude. The, the 1945 moment was an extraordinary moment in human history, and things were put in place, and institutions and laws and procedures which offered hope for a new direction. As I said earlier, that hope has not been completely fulfilled, but that doesn't mean we give up on the whole thing. It means we have to redouble our efforts on the enforcement of the principles and the rules uh, that were put in place. And I think that imposes a responsibility on individual citizens. It is best encapsulated by my good friend Nicholas Frank, the son of Hans Frank, and he says it in our film, My Nazi Legacy, which some of you will have seen last night. He says, what happened in Germany in the 1930s happened because there was an absence of civil courage. And the absence of civil courage is something that is not monopolized by Germany. It exists in my country. It exists in Australia. It exists in every country where it is easier to turn one's face away from a particular horror because it seems too difficult or it's just safer for oneself to not do the right thing. And I think for each and every one of us, it's a man to, of individual conscience, conscience to not turn away, but to focus on the things that are difficult and unpalatable. And only when that happens with enough people can the system of international justice cut into play. I, I suppose what I'm saying is don't stop the struggle and the fight just because the international system isn't delivering. It will deliver one day, it may not be imminently, may not be tomorrow, but it's a long struggle and, it, it, and don't give up. 
Thanks for the question, Pamela. Um, I don't need to commend the book to you because he's got John le Carre and Anthony Beaver on the book, <laughs> so don't really need to add my name to it. But it is great. It does really read like a detective story. I've dog eared a whole lot of little pages here. There's tons of aha moments, and you heard what a fantastic speaker he is. He writes just the same way. He will be signing books um, at the Festival Bookshop, which I think is near the entrance to Acme. So why don't we put our hands together and thank Philippe for having a chat to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.